Yes. I almost forgot to do this again. I may need your help with this.
guys let's get back get ready for back to school are you ready all right shout, shout the answer when you know Okay, I know these flashcards are horrible, but come on. Four. Three. Three. Good. Two. Two. You guys are good. How are you able to answer these questions so fast? Well, if you've never studied any math before in your life, do you think you could have answered those questions? It's easy to give an answer in math if you know how to find the answer. And once you learn the answer, you can get quicker, like flashcards will get better and quicker and more confident um, with your math facts. Well, giving an answer about Jesus works the same way. The more we study God's word, the better we know the story of Jesus. And the more we talk about it at church and with friends, um, the more quickly you can answer and the easier it becomes to answer. The Bible says that make sure in your hearts that Christ is Lord. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope that you have. Be ready to give the reason for it. So if someone asks, what do you believe, can you answer them? If they ask you who Jesus is, can you tell them? The good news is, all of the answers that you need are in your Bible. And if you know your Bible, you can be ready to give an answer. Sharing your faith is one of the most important things you can and this is important going back to school. Jesus died for everyone, and he's counting on us to give the good news to others. Make a commitment this year to study God's word and be ready to give an answer at any time because it's the most important answer you can give. Next Sunday, we will be doing our back to school blessing of the backpacks. So um, we're asking that all kids or teachers, anyone that's going to be going back to school, um, bring something that represents um, the start of the school year to you. Um, and even if you're learning from home, um, keep in mind that we want to include you as well. So um, think about something that represents how your school year is going to look. Um, let us pray over those things. Um, so try to remember to bring those next Sunday. Let's end in prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, I pray that everyone here will take the time to study your word this year so that all of us will be ready to give an answer when asked about your son, Jesus. Please watch over students, teachers, and their families as they prepare to head back to school next week. And to everyone that works in the district, keep everyone safe and healthy. In Jesus' name.
a teenager was discussing that she wanted to get one of the new iPhones. She had seen the commercials and was convinced that she just had to have one. So she began pricing them, but was in for quite the shock when she discovered that they were, oh my goodness, horribly expensive. However, she learned that her cellular provider company had come to her rescue because they would allow her to get a brand new iPhone and they would break it up into payments. She could get the iPhone she wanted and she could pay for it over 24 months. And then it would be hers free and clear. Of course, by that time, there would be a new phone that she wanted, and she would have to start that process all over again. But it was an option, and she was considering it as a good option. And if she got the phone this way, then she could have the phone. It could be paid over time. She could pay for it with those monthly installments of only $45 a month on top of their regular cell phone. Obviously, this was the way to go. And so when she had determined this information and she knew what she wanted to do, armed with this truth, she hit up mom and dad with her great idea. She explained how she could get this new iPhone and how it would only cause their cell phone bill to go up $45 a month plus the, the one-time activation fees. Well, mom was actually willing to work with her. And she said, they could do this. And her face just lit up and she was very excited until mom put in the rest of the sentence. And she said, we can do this if you will come up with the $45 a month. Every month. For the next two years. Well, now suddenly we have a problem. Which she verbalized to her mother in a very mature fashion where she said, And where am I supposed to get $45 a month? <laughs> so that, you know, mom has these ideas. And so mom began to discuss with her that she could get a job. Or she could even do some extra chores around the house. And they would pay her to do those extra chores. Because there were lots of things that could be done. The grass needed to be mowed every week. She could take care of the dog, she could feed the dog, and water the dog, and give the dog a bath every couple of weeks, and she could do some extra housework because goodness knows mom wasn't super jazzed about vacuuming and dusting and sweeping and mopping and cleaning the sinks and the toilet and all that. Well, she went, oh, you're kidding me. So she said, the work. Well, we can, we can figure out another option. If you don't want to work around the house, then you can always get a job outside the house. Chick-fil-A, Burger King, McDonald's, they are all hiring. And told her that she could get a job there and she could earn money there and pay for her phone that she wanted. Why she thought about this as she talked with mom about it, she determined this is, this is going to require a lot from her. She was very happy. This is going to cut into her extracurricular activities at school. This was going to cut into her time with her friends on the weekend. This was going to cause her to be more pressed because there were going to be other demands on her time besides homework and studying. This was going to be a pain. And mom made it clear that this would mean a lot of extra responsibility because they weren't going to pay for this if she didn't have the money. And so she was actually going to have to put in the hours needed and work somewhere. She was hesitant. Because the challenge was she wanted her free time, but she also wanted a new iPhone. And while she was convinced that mom and dad could just pay for it, well, it's pretty clear that really wasn't an option that was on the table. And so now mom has this plan that she could work and earn it herself instead of them just giving it to her. So now, now she has to decide what she really wants. Did she really want a new iPhone? Or did she really want her free time to be able to do things with her friends? Which was more important? Which did she want the most? She had to make a choice. Now, we regularly face our own choices. Probably not whether to run out and buy the newest iPhone or not. But we have choices that we have to make regarding how we use our time. Do we use our time for work? 
or for sleep, for ministry, for family, for recreation. There are choices to be made. There are also sacrifices that come with every choice that we make. Because with only so much time, with only so much energy, with only so much money, something is always going to get sacrificed when we make the choices that we make. Because to choose to do one thing is to choose not to do another. To choose to spend money over here is a choice not to spend it over there. This happens with every aspect of life. Choices can be a challenge. Jesus knew that believers were going to have to make choices, and sometimes even difficult choices, hard choices. And so he specifically addresses the decisions that we make. The broad strokes, but he addresses the decisions that we make and how we are called to make those decisions as we live the life of faith, as we walk the walk as followers of Christ. And so as we think about our choices, we're going to look at what Jesus says about our choices, and we're going to see what those choices are that he calls us to make. So let's look at our passage for this morning. We're continuing in Matthew chapter 7. This morning our passage is Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. As Jesus speaks in his followers, we see that following Christ involves choice and challenge. As Jesus is talking with his followers, with his disciples in verses 13 and 14, he shows them that there are two options that they can choose from. And he calls them, and as we read this this morning, he calls us to actually make a choice. The question that everybody has to answer is, what will you choose? What will you choose today? What will you choose this week? What will you choose to do? Do you choose door number one? Or do you choose gate number one or gate number two? It almost sounds like a, a game show when a contestant is asked, do you want door number one or door number two? But, but this is not a game. This is real life that has real results that are much more significant than any choice you can make on a game show. But Jesus gives them the option, the option of the narrow gate or the wide gate. There are only two possibilities that they can choose from, and these are them. So there has to be a choice. He shows that they will have to make some kind of choice. They naturally will make some kind of choice. There is no, well, I'm just not going to make a decision. I'm not going to make a choice. Nope, that's not an option. Because what you do every day is going to demonstrate that choice. It's a choice they actually will make. And even attempting not to choose is a choice, whether they realize it or not. They will make some decision as far as how they're going to live and which gate, which road they're going to travel. And part of this point is that this choice has to be intentional. Because like it or not, they will have to make that decision. And like it or not, they will make that decision based on what they do, based on how they live. It reminds me of the choice that Joshua gives the people of Israel at the end of his book. After they had conquered part of the promised land, you get to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, and Joshua has all of Israel together, and he is addressing them, and he says, Choose this day who you will serve. They have a choice. Regarding how they are going to go forward, who they are going to serve as they go forward, as they are already into the promised land. Will they serve the Lord who has brought them to this point? Will they serve the false gods that are, that are present in this land and, and these people? They have to choose. Jesus tells these followers, his disciples in Matthew chapter 7, that they have a choice to make as well. Some choice is going to get made as they go through life, so they need to make a choice, and they need to make the right one. But while Jesus tells them that they need to make a choice, the cool thing in this passage is that Jesus actually tells them what the right choice is. It's like taking an open book test that Jesus says, and by the way, here are the answers. This is what you're supposed to do here. Just in case there's any question, just in case there's any misunderstanding, Jesus says, this is the right response. Notice Jesus says, enter through. He's given them two choices of gates to enter. They can choose one or the other. You can't do both. 
there's a wide gate, there's a narrow gate. You need to decide. You don't get to stay off the road because as you travel through this thing called life, you're going to journey down one road or the other. Everyone goes through a gate, everyone travels on a road, so everyone has to make a choice. Everyone chooses a gate or a road. But Jesus also shows that as that choice is intentional, it's going to involve some level of challenge. There's a wide gate, there's a narrow gate. There's a wide road that's easy, there's a hard road that's narrow. The wide gate leads to an easy road. The narrow gate leads to a hard road. Both are in front of them. They have to choose which gate, which road they will follow. But to choose is to choose. Narrow, hard, wide, easy. Wide, easy. And the indication is that the wide road, the easy road, is there and it's right in front of them. It's plainly visible. It's tread a lot. There are lots and lots of others all over it. You can't miss it. You just go with the flow and follow the crowd and you will see where the easy road takes you. But notice Jesus says the, the narrow gate, the hard way, not as easy. It's going to take some effort to find it, to travel it, to see it, to find it, to follow it. You have to want to find it. You have to look for it because you want to travel on it. It's shown to those who search for it, who try to discern what it looks like, and even when they find it, the hard way is, by definition, well, hard. It's not easy. It's not fun. It requires sacrifice. Because when you think about it, to, to follow Christ, to be a believer, this particular gate and path are different from what the world around you will be doing. Even more, this gate, this way, will be difficult. It will create challenges. It will demand sacrifice. Jesus says many will choose to take the easy way. They may know that there is more to life. They may know that there are things that they should be doing, that they should be living differently or doing things differently than they are, but they refuse to look for and find and travel that narrow gate and that hard road. They don't want the challenge. They don't want the, the struggle. But in looking at the passage, we see that Jesus calls us to see things from a much bigger picture perspective. Notice that each gate, each road leads somewhere. There is a final destination. The destination has a road that you travel to get there. If you travel that road, you will reach that destination. He discusses the gate to that road. And he even discusses you know, how they get there and what that road looks like as they're traveling. But as he talks about these gates, these ways, he shows that they have eternal consequences. As Jesus talks about this, he's having a discussion about eternity and where people are going to spend the earth. However, this isn't just a discussion about the destination. This is a discussion about how we get there. The journey toward eternity is how we arrive at eternity. And boys and girls, that turn is happening right now. So it becomes a question of which, which road we're traveling on. As we read this, I know that we're, we're used to having to make choices and, and even knowing that those choices will impact us. We make choices all the time. I can choose to eat cookies, or in my case, vanilla zingers, and my blood sugar will go up and, and, and I will not be as healthy. Or I can eat fruits and vegetables and I will be healthier. Of choice. I can choose to sit in my chair and watch TV or put some kind of electronic device in my hand and watch cat videos on Facebook. <laughs> or I can get up and exercise. I can take a walk. I can ride my bike. I can lift weights. I can do something active and I will be in better shape. I will be healthier physically. I have a choice. I can choose to save some of my money now for retirement, or I can choose to spend it all now and not be prepared for when I reach retirement age. I have a choice. I can be honest in my dealings with others that have a good reputation, or I can be shifty and shady and not have a good reputation. I have a choice. <coughs> I can be faithful to God's word in my daily life. I can follow Christ's teaching and, and live the faith that I claim. Or I can be unfaithful to what God calls me to do and go my own way. I have a choice. We regularly face choices in our day-to-day -day life. We're used to making choices. But I want you to notice the consequences of this choice that gets made. 
Because this isn't a choice about your blood sugar or your energy level or your retirement or whether you might gain a few pounds or not. This choice is about how you live today and what you do with your life. And this choice has lasting, eternal consequences. Jesus says the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. He says the gate is narrow, the road is hard that leads to life. And he says that there are few who find and take that road that leads to life. And if we read this, we all understand that as he talks about destruction and as he talks about life, he's not talking about destruction and life here. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about final judgment. He's talking about eternal life or being eternally separated from the presence of God and an eternity before him. This is heaven and hell. Jesus calls his disciples then and now to see, to understand the significance of the choices that we make day in and day out in our everyday life because they will impact our eternity. You know, very often when I talk to people about eternity, when we start discussing where they will spend eternity, I watch people start shifting in their chair. They start getting uncomfortable. And some people will talk about being good people, like their good works are enough to get them there, so I do this list of things, and so surely I'm okay. Some people will actually talk about knowing that things should be different. Knowing that they need to be doing some things differently, that they need to make some things right soon, that they need to follow scripture's teaching or live their faith. But even when I hear people talk about those things, very often I hear people talk about, well, when. And it's not uncommon for people to admit that they aren't where they need to be spiritually, that they aren't living their faith as well as they could. And I even hear them say things like, I know that I'm not doing what I need to be doing right now. But then they start talking about when. They will talk about when they will make these needed changes in life. When they will do things differently. It's often in the context of, well, someday. I will get right. I will make things right with God later. After I've had my fun, when the kids are older, when I am older, when I'm done running around, or when things settle down, sometime before I die. When. And sadly, our, our world often makes decisions based on what's going on around us now. We look at what's happening now. We look at opportunities that we have now. And while we may admit that we need to do something different, we work from the premise of, well, there's always later. So when? I'll make a change. And we may plan for that, or we may kind of leave that open-ended in some day, some point in my life. One day. When it becomes a little more pressing, when it's more convenient, when? But the problem with that line of thinking is that we forget that we're not promised tomorrow. Shoot, we're not even promised the rest of today. Sometimes we see this a little more clearly. We recognize that we need to do something today. We see this at times. Someone has a brush with death and suddenly they, they start reevaluating. When 9-11 happened, the churches became a lot fuller because suddenly we recognized just how, how significant that event was and how frail life is. Sometimes when something tragic happens or someone gets a terminal illness or some disease and they know their time is limited, they seem to see a lot more clearly. Sometimes we don't know how Sometimes things are a shock, even a surprise. Sometimes things happen and we don't see them coming. February of last year, my father-in-law was having a good day. On February 7th of 2019, he was joking with people. He ate dinner with the people that he normally ate with. Around 6.15, he was sitting in his little apartment area watching TV when they came in and gave him his medicine. Somewhere between 6.30 and 8 o'clock that night, he passed away. Candace and I knew he had some health issues, but we thought he had a long time. We found out that faithful night that uh, we were wrong. We don't always know how long we have. We often assume that we will have tomorrow, but it's not promised. 
We plan, we hope, we expect that Jesus shows us in our passage that our responsibility is to do the right thing and live rightly now as we walk the road. You are walking through the walk of life as you are journeying along. It's important to know which gate you're going through, which road you're walking on. How you live your faith will impact you today, but it will also impact your eternity. Jesus tells us to enter through the narrow gate to take the, the hard road, the hard road. I heard a pastor friend of mine say that there are three no's that Satan uses with people, and especially with Christians. That he will try to convince you first that there is no heaven. That you're wasting your time, that this is as good as it's going to be, and why would you suffer and struggle and go through all this sacrifice and be frustrated because there is no eternal reward? He'll try to convince you there's no heaven. Secondly, he'll try to convince you there is no hell, that you should just live it up and do what you want to because there is no punishment for doing some of these things that many might consider bad. These things that you naturally want to do, they can't truly be that bad if you want to do them, and there's not going to be any punishment for that anyway. He'll try to convince you there is no hell. But I think his most effective one is the third one. Because he will try to convince you there is no hurry. That even if there is a heaven and a hell and, and all this heaven and hell business is, is accurate, you've got time. You've got all the time in the world. You can make it right later. You can do it tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, even in the next five or ten years. And he will try to convince you there is no hurry about getting things right with God. The scripture reminds us there is a heaven, there is a hell. Jesus reminds us today in our passage that there is a hurry, but the time is not promised to us. It could happen any day. That's why we are to enter through the narrow gate. We are to travel the hard way. Because Jesus is going to return. Or someday we're going to be called home. And we don't know yet. But we need to be prepared. As I look at this passage, I also see that Jesus reminds us that the crowd doesn't always know. Notice the statement that he makes in these verses. There are many who take the wide gate and the easy road. As far as popularity, as far as the majority doing something, the wide gate can have hands down. Lots of people like the wide gate and the easy road. It's crowded with people. Jesus says there are few who find and take the narrow gate and the hard road. Because it's not as popular. It's not what the majority of people are doing. It's not how they are living. There are not many people who will make the sacrifices and do what needs to be done and faithfully follow Christ through that narrow gate and that hard way. Let me just remind you that you can't gauge right or wrong based on majority lifestyle or popular opinion. Society and culture are not our gauge for what is right and wrong. That's not how it works. God is the author of right and wrong, good and bad. If you want to understand what God calls us to do, read his word. Listen to the leading of the Spirit. He is the one who will tell you what is right. And we also point out that the, the narrow gate, the hard road, are not hidden. They're in plain sight. Someone may have to point it out to the world as they travel down that road. But when someone sees it, when someone is shown that gate, they have to be willing to go through it to take that path. The indication is it just isn't as appealing. They don't choose to make that choice. Well, everybody else is doing this on this wide gate and easy road. All the cool kids, all the popular people, everyone else is. And whether it's friends or culture or society or whatever, the majority of the crowd and the people are going to do things the easy way. We're going to hold, they're going to hold beliefs or act in ways that are easier rather than doing the right things. We see it in our society all the time. And we have a natural tendency to follow the crowd because we like to be accepted. We like to fit in. We like for everyone to like us. And not to think that we're ignorant or judgmental or closed-minded or just wrong. But Jesus' point is that believers, followers, are going to have to make a choice about how they're going to live, what they're going to do. It might be easier, it might be more popular to take the wide, easy road. More people will be living and believing that way. It would be much less challenging to do what society or culture or everyone else is doing. Believe what everyone else is believing and just go with the flow. 
Let me also remind you in our passage, Jesus said, that way leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. And I'm just going to say that if that doesn't break your heart, if it doesn't burden your heart that there are those around us who do not know, those around us who haven't heard, those around us who are misguided, then I think you need to do a heart check. Because if you aren't moved by the lost state of those on that wide, easy road, then something needs to be changed within you. Because it calls us to love our neighbors, even the ones that are lost. And those people are lost. They are on the pathway to destruction. And we as believers, we as followers of Christ, have the knowledge and the ability to change that. As I read, I see that the hard road, the narrow gate, lead to life. And since there are few who find it, we see that it takes an effort not only to find it and to travel it, but to share it so others can find it and travel it as well. But you have to want to find it. You have to want to live that way. You have to recognize the need, the value of that relationship with Christ and that life of following Him, living for Him. You have to want the life that He offers and recognize the need for it. Because the narrow hard way is not easy. It's definitely not as popular. When you think about what life in Christ looks like, when you think about what life in Christ entails, discipleship, following, that's hard. It will involve challenges and trials and struggles and being unpopular. It will be difficult because God's standards are pretty high. Loving God first and foremost is hard in a society where there are hundreds of other things that compete with that place of power. It's hard to make God first and to keep Him first. It's hard to love your neighbors, even when some of them are not very loving. Especially when some of them act like jerks. When they're hateful or work against you. But we're called to love our neighbors. It's hard to live by Scripture when our society and our culture belittle and demean Scripture and, and demean believers for holding to it and living by it. It's hard to forgive a person who continues to sin against you again and again. It's hard to stand up for God's truth that is going to that is that is going to cause a world to call you closed-minded and judgmental and sometimes even hypocritical. It's hard to stand up for biblical truths in a world that doesn't know or emphasize the full counsel of God, that only emphasizes love and forgiveness and ignores looking at right and wrong, good and bad, or really different. It's hard to live for Christ and serve using your spiritual gifts, your talents in the church and working in the church when so many other things are important. It's hard to give your 10% when everything costs so much. It's hard to live by faith instead of by sight and to stand up for what Christ says is right even when it can impact you negatively or cause you to lose friends or finances or opportunities. It's hard to hold biblical views on various cultural issues, let alone issues like Sabbath or ministry or evangelism or discipleship or a whole host of other things that Scripture tells us about. The narrow gate, the hard way, are just sat there hard. Jesus never says, come follow me and life will be one big cake. He says, come follow me. And it will be hard. People will hate you and mistreat you. People will work against you and cast you out. People will leave you out of things and persecute you. But he says, come follow me. Go through the narrow gate, travel the hard way, because that leads to life. It may not lead to popularity or on the social calendar. It might not lead to being the life of the party. It might not lead to lots of friends or fun or resources or stuff or the things the world says are signs of success. But it leads to life. And real life only comes through Jesus Christ. You remind us there are few who find it. The gate, the way are there for any to follow and travel on if we will. If you will. If those around you will. The question is will. Will you? As we look at what Jesus says about walking the walk, about living the life he calls us to live, let me just ask you this morning, what are you choosing? Since the life of discipleship and following Christ involves choices, 
how are you choosing? What are you choosing? Are you choosing to go through the narrow gate, to, to travel the hard way? Or are you content to travel on the wide, easy gate and go with the flow? I know we like for things to be easy. We often think things should be a lot easier than they are. But, but when it comes to how you're living and how you are following the calling of Christ on your life, what choices are you making? Are you taking the narrow hard way or the narrow easy way? And as you look at the choices that you're making, why are you making them? Are you seeing and being guided by a bigger picture? Do you see how you are living as a demonstration of your faith and, and your eternal destination? Do you recognize your choices regarding living your faith as, as something that is going to determine where you end up? Do you see your choices and how you are living your faith as obedience to Christ and his calling on your life? As you look at how you're living compared with the lives of those who are around you who might not know Christ, is there a difference? Are your life and lifestyle different from those who don't know who aren't following Christ? When it comes to your choices, are you following the crowd or are you following Christ? Because Jesus says we will make a choice. So how are you choosing to live? Who determines how you're living, how you're making your decisions in your life? Our musicians are going to come, they're going to prepare to lead us in our song of response, but as they are coming, perhaps this morning you've realized that you aren't living the life Christ has called you to live. Maybe you've realized that you aren't in a relationship with him, that you've listened to what he has to say this morning in our passage, and you realize that instead of walking the wide, easy road, Instead of taking the road that leads to destruction, you, you need to make a change. That you need to be who and what Christ has called you to be. What good news for you today, because Christ offers His grace, He offers His forgiveness to all who will believe, who are willing to commit to, to follow Him and living for Him. And if you make that decision this morning that you can leave here forgiven in relationship with Him, and you can begin that journey on the road He has for you, you need to make that this morning. Maybe you recognize that you already know him, but you realize that your perspective, your understanding, the way you see things has gotten a little skewed. Maybe you realize you haven't been as willing to walk that narrow, hard road. Maybe there are some areas where you compromise. Maybe your life and lifestyle doesn't look that much different from someone around you who doesn't have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you recognize that you have settled, you've compromised. You've made choices to go the easy way instead of living the life that Christ called you to live. Perhaps this morning you recognize that you just need to get back in right, right fellowship and relationship with Him. You need to apply biblical principles to your life and lifestyle. You need to change what you are doing and how you are doing it so that you are walking in a way that demonstrates your faith more you need to move back to Christ instead of following the path of faith? Our musicians are going to lead us in their song of response. As Christ is speaking this morning, Christ is speaking. What's he saying? How is he asking you to respond? And will you make that response this morning as we sing? Let's stand as we
I'm sure you know that there will not be an offering plate coming your way. There are offering boxes to your left, to your right, and then the one in the back of the church. Now let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things, and in you all things exist. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offer into your storehouse, and that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down blessings upon blessings. Accept the gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives. May the love of God surround us. May the Spirit of God empower us. And may the joy of God uphold us. In Christ's name we pray.
morning to worship together and hear from Christ. Now let us go out and make a difference in our world for the kingdom, proclaiming his gospel and administrating his name. And as you go, may you go in peace as servants of Christ. May you experience the salvation that he has prepared for you and for all who believe in his name. And in your going, may he hold you as you seek to serve in his name this week.